1876, Thomas Edison stood in a grassy field gazing at this building in Menlo Park, New Jersey. It didn't look like much at the time. Menlo Park was just another half-finished suburban development outside New York. But this building, in that sleepy little hamlet, would turn out to be Edison's greatest invention, arguably even surpassing the light bulb in the scope of worldwide change it would usher in. This is the light bulb moment, a Cheddar and Curiosity Stream original series. We often think of great inventors carrying out their work in solitude. Stories of invention are often retold as tales of individualistic pursuit. Someone with a brilliant mind taps into their innate talent to create something groundbreaking. From an early age, Edison pursued his curiosity this way. But later, he broke the mold. Born in 1847, young Edison had trouble in school. But his mother, believing his teachers had underestimated his potential and likely having trouble affording his private school costs, pulled him out of class to homeschool him in Port Huron, Michigan. This gave Edison the freedom and the opportunity to indulge his appetite for knowledge. But he didn't just want to read about the world, he wanted to get out in it. And so he got a job on the railroad as what was called a butcher boy. And a butcher boy was a kid basically who sold uh, newspapers, magazines, dime novels, candy to writers on the train. He quickly built a thriving small business, taking in about eight to ten dollars per day in revenue. Then one day, while hanging around a train station at the age of about 15, Edison happened to see a young boy playing on the rails as a train was approaching. He jumped into action and pulled the boy to safety just in time, saving the boy's life. The boy's father felt so indebted to Edison that he taught Edison Morse code. Learning Morse code opened up the world of telegraphs and allowed him to get a job as a telegraph operator bouncing from city to city as he perfected his skills. He used the time to familiarize himself with telegraph technology, fiddle with its hardware, and start working on his own inventions. He actually kept a little notebook that we still have that shows his experimental work. One of the key features of the telegraph in this period was something called a repeater. Telegraph signals could only be sent about 250 miles before the battery power was insufficient. And so they had to find a way to automatically resend the message. Edison had what was called a button repeater that was subsequently noted in one of the early telegraph manuals. And this is the first invention that we know of that Edison really developed. This all combined with his charming sense of humor and charismatic self-confidence to help him lure financial backers. Soon, he had enough money to quit his job and become a full-time inventor. Around this time, Edison got some of his first hints that it might be helpful to create with other people. So in Boston, Edison, when he first got there, had gone around to all the telegraph and electrical manufacturing shops, and there were lots of them in Boston. And he had actually begun to have his work done by uh, one of the major shops there, owned by a fellow named Charles Williams, Jr. Later on, a guy named Alexander Graham Bell brought his then telegraph instruments to Williams' shop, where he joined up with a guy named Thomas Watson, who was a machinist. This turned into the telephone. So Charles Williams, Jr. shop is a crucial site of invention in this period, and that's true more generally. Machine shops, not just in the telegraph industry, but all industries, whether it's making textiles, printing, all of those industries need machine shops to manufacture the equipment. And so Edison knew about the kind of experimental work that was going on in these shops. Eventually, Edison headed down to New York in the hopes it would offer more opportunity for him than Boston. Edison had found a use for his talents in the growing industry of stock and commodities trading. 
people trading on these markets wanted access to information about price fluctuations quickly. So all these little telegraph networks sprung up servicing that need. Edison's thorough knowledge of telegraph machinery made him a valuable asset to these companies and helped him anticipate ways to improve their systems. He quickly began making money off his ideas. This allowed him to start establishing his own shops in New Jersey. This period marked a substantial transformation in how Edison invented. Now, he had his own space with craftsmen and machinists who could streamline his invention process. Edison also started making major strides on a daring new invention that would revolutionize the telegraph world. In 1874, he finally got it right. It was called the quadruplex telegraph and it allowed four messages to be sent on a single line. This is a major, major improvement. Uh, it really reduces the amount of wire and telegraph lines. This is the most expensive part of the network, right? Putting up poles and stringing wire. Funds from the quadruplex eventually helped him move forward onto his next major endeavor, building a world-class laboratory that could supercharge his inventive potential. And with that, Edison's vision for Menlo Park was born. Edison opened his new lab in 1876. With Menlo Park, Edison wanted to create an invention factory. In the early days, it would be a tight-knit, small handful of machinists and experimenters he had worked with before. But as time went on, it would grow into an eclectic group of dozens of men. The team would primarily work on fleshing out Edison's ideas. He would charge them with focusing on a problem he was facing, further pursuing a whim of his constantly active mind, or building a plan he had drawn up and was ready to take to the next stage. Right away, Edison's invention factory began to produce groundbreaking technology. It started with inventions like the phonograph, the first device that could record and play back sound. But the early fanfare surrounding the phonograph was just a warm-up for another invention that would define Edison's legacy, the light bulb. There is a folksy tale told and retold about Thomas Edison and his comfort with failure. When questioned about experiencing so much failure inventing the light bulb, Edison replies, I have not failed 10,000 times. I've successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. But here's the thing. He never said this about the light bulb. In fact, Edison wasn't even the first person to invent a light bulb. People have been experimenting for 40 years on incandescent lights. There were all sorts of patents. The problem was keeping them lit and having a distribution system that didn't cost too much money. Commercializing the light bulb posed a ton of problems. The folklore about Edison failing 10,000 times really pays homage to him and his team's unique ability to overcome those problems by coordinating their experimental efforts. Edison could guide these efforts with his latest ideas scrawled in his notebook or his latest insights from scientific literature. Then, he could let his team investigate, reporting back results that, in turn, informed what they would spend their time investigating next. One of the biggest challenges was figuring out how to design the filament, the part of the bulb that actually lights up. Before Edison, most affordable filaments could only create light that lasted a very short period of time minutes or hours. Edison tapped his old friend, Charles Batchelor, to help him change that. The two created countless sketches of early bulb designs. In some of Edison's first experiments with electric lights, he had used carbonized organic compounds, like paper, to create the filament. But the radiance only lasted a few moments before the current fried the filament and it went up in smoke. So Edison, Batchelor, and the wider team began testing various metals that they hoped might last longer. This led them to platinum. Indeed, platinum worked better. It didn't flare out right away. They were also able to design a bulb that shut on and off the current before heat overwhelmed the filament. And Charles Batchelor was able to increase its radiance by winding thin filaments of platinum into tight spirals. But it still wasn't lasting as long as Edison needed it to in order to be commercially viable. So he heats up 
platinum and other metals to see what's going on. And he discovers that as they're heating, they're also absorbing hydrogen in particular uh, from the air, and that's causing bubbles and cracks. Edison focused on solving this problem with a Bavarian glassblower at Menlo Park, Ludwig Bohm. In addition to working on the glass bulbs design, Bohm spent countless hours collaborating with the team to craft and perfect cutting edge vacuum technology that would vastly reduce the amount of air interacting with the platinum. As they got the vacuum technology worked out, they realized they would probably never be able to make the platinum bulbs affordable. Platinum was just too expensive. So Edison had his experimenters switch back to testing the carbonization of cheaper, organic materials for the filament. Finally, Edison's research led him to, of all things, a Japanese variety of bamboo. It could last over 1,200 hours, or 50 days. It was 1880, and Edison's burgeoning R&D team had just produced what we would come to call the light bulb. All in all, Edison and his team likely tested thousands of designs at Menlo Park for the light bulb itself. No one inventor could have ever undertaken such a massive feat. But working under Edison's direction, his experimenters were able to unify and coordinate their eureka moments, building out entire systems to carry light into people's homes. Eventually, the research and development model largely pioneered by Edison began to percolate into the wider corporate playbook. Throughout the 20th century, companies like GE opened massive facilities solely focused on research and development. GE's labs went on to popularize X-ray technology, produce the first American jet engine, and develop improved vacuum tubes that revolutionized electronics. AT&T would establish Bell Labs in the 1920s, which would go on to build the first transistors and lasers. The list goes on and on, leading right up to today as knowledge birthed from R&D, runs our iPhones, sits inside life-saving vaccines, and enables our AI-powered personal assistants. So as we look back at Edison's legacy, we can see that it encompasses far more than just the light bulb. His invention factory lives on in companies, universities, and government agencies around the world as the modern R&D lab. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. You can watch full 22-minute episodes every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Cheddar's live network or anytime on CuriosityStream.